Professor Marty, it's a pleasure to meet with you and finally get a chance to talk with you. I'd like to start off uh, by asking you a little bit about uh, growing up in Nebraska. What sort of values uh, shaped your upbringing? I have a Swiss ancestry of uh, stolid, serious, sober sorts. And uh, my mother's German side was a more uh, happy-go-lucky, buoyant type, and I like to think there was that fusion. My father was a school teacher and was my teacher for some years, and um, a church organist. I fell in love with Bach and church music. I was babysat in a church pew during many a funeral. <laughs> but uh, I think we learned uh, most of all uh, from our parents the uh, impulse to be kind and um, faithful. You know, can we, I'm sorry, can we mm -hmm. try? Sure. The, uh, the zoom out didn't happen on you know, it's a little bit of a surprise in there. Mm -hmm. just oh. So here we are again. <laughs> and how long are you normally in the office here during the day? Just curious. How, how long? How long, are you, how long of a day do you keep over here? Oh, um, noon till four, five, six, whatever it takes. Sometimes I stay till six because then the rush hours. Oh, yeah. Fast. I get home just fast if I left at five. <laughs> it depends on what's on in the evening. Professor Marty, it's a pleasure to meet you and finally get a chance to talk to you. I'd like to like to begin with uh, some of the things that's, that shaped you as a young man, uh, your, your childhood in Nebraska. What were some of the values that uh, helped uh, get you on your way? The frame of my childhood was the Depression and Bout and Dust Bowl. Uh, we were in a small town and all my relatives were farmers and they saw the grasshoppers take their fields and the dust uh, take their things and eventually the uh, loan companies take their farms. So there was a very realistic context to it all and yet our parents and all the people around us created for the children a, uh, a, a kind of a warm climate. You were aware of the brute force of these things but uh, I think we were taught to uh, be generous, I hope, and kind. Uh, the word everyone who knew my father says of him, and um, uh, faithful, fidelity, it was a big thing for him. What did they do? My father was a teacher, my mother was, uh, I suppose you'd say, a homemaker uh, with a lot of interests. Uh, my father taught in a Lutheran school and was a church organist. He had tremendous literary interests, and my brother, my sister, and I often can find ourselves reciting reams of poetry by Emerson and uh, uh, recall of uh, all kinds of the writings of 19th century authors whom he liked very much. So you came by a love of literature very early in life. Yes, these were small towns with small libraries. I think we read right through them. And he always managed to buy little series of little leather-bound books from some peddler or other, and we'd get our Shakespeare that way, and uh, all kinds of such authors. Who were your favorite <coughs> authors? Well, I think uh, not necessarily in childhood, but as, as recalling that childhood world, I probably read more and could give a lecture on, if I had to, uh, Willa Cather, uh, Mari Sandoz, Wright Morris. I, I collect Great Plains novels, and I think it goes back, uh, back to them a good deal. But uh, we were brought up on a lot of Shakespeare, and uh, I remember reading Iliad and Odyssey as a little boy. They all sunk in, and I love just children's books, too. Uh, who doesn't when you're a child? What led you to a life in a life in the church? One side of my brain, I suppose, got programmed a little bit when I would uh, see uh, my father and mother would babysit me very often uh, on a church pew while he's playing organ, she's in the choir. So I got a pretty heavy dose of it, and that normally leads to reaction. But I also saw uh, generosity. I recall uh, there were floods in Louisville, and in the midst of the Depression, I remember the minister holding up a plate full of dollar bills. We never saw dollar bills, but these people were sharing. I think that touched me a lot, <clears throat> and uh, I don't think I had a clarified sense of a life in religion quite that early, but uh, in my sophomore high school year, I went off to a prep school that uh, many people went to ministry from, and that gave me a chance to learn a good deal, learn the languages, uh, get a running start. And it was not though until I tried out the seminary that I was sure that I wanted uh, really ministry and not scholarship at that time. Who were some of the, the people who uh, uh, were your intellectual mentors, uh, your intellectual favorites as you, uh, as you started your career in the ministry and then later in, uh, later in writing? 
In uh, ministry and theology, a <clears throat> wonderful man who died about 10 years ago, a blind theologian, blind in his last 10 years, named Joseph Sittler. Didn't write an awful lot, but had tremendous impact on people, a, a rhetorician like none I've ever known. He could do whatever he wanted with words. And um, he could take you through Melville and Henry Adams and the Gospels all in one swoop. Um, my teacher of preaching, Richard R. Kemmer, a St. Louisan, who really gave us the uh, heart of the sense of what it's all about. And third, uh, Sidney Mead, a uh, great historian of American religion. I suppose I'd put those three on top. I learned a lot from the later Librarian of Congress, Daniel Borston, uh, about intellectual history more than religious. <coughs> you, uh, at one time as a student, created a fictional theologian by the name of, is it Bibfeld? Franz Bibfeld. B-I-B-F-E-L-D-T. His papers are in the archives at the University of Chicago, uh, special collections, quite seriously. Uh, he's, uh, um, I, th I think he used to have a website. He's, uh, often things come on my email, uh, latest traces of him. He's cataloged in some libraries. Um, he's all over the place. There's a whole book about him, in fact. Uh, no, he didn't exist. We, we invented him as kind of a hoax on the faculty, and half the faculty caught on and thought it was funny. And the other half didn't catch on. I didn't think it was funny. And uh, instead of sending me off to London, where I was supposed to have been a minister to displaced persons after the war, they sent me to a parish in Illinois for seasoning. And that parish had that their assistants had to do doctoral work. That's how I stumbled into a life of scholarship. Well, now that was that was the next question I was <laughs> going to ask. You came to you came to the University of Chicago. <clears throat> I was already an ordained minister for two years. And um, as part of my punishment, uh, I got a master's degree at a seminary. And some University of Chicago profs there spotted me and said, uh, we can get you a fellowship, a uh, free ride, if you'll come down and study. And so I uh, suspended my pastoral ministry and went down there and uh, moved very rapidly uh, through the curriculum. But I did go back for seven more years to uh, start a new congregation near O'Hare Field. I loved the pastorate. I really loved it. But the pull of scholarship and the demands and the opportunities were so strong that eventually I went that way 35 years ago, full time. What are the things that chiefly interest you? You've written some 50 books now, 4,000 articles and more. Uh, what are the things that uh, pique your interest? What subjects do you, do you thrive on? Well, I start with history itself. I like to quote the great British economic historian R.H. Tawney, who said, uh, I find the world very odd, and I try to figure out how it got that way. Uh, I like to study the human comedy, the human tragedy, the accidents of history, and so on. But then you have to have a subject matter. And uh, I got into the long pull history first of Christianity. I've been interested in all its ages. Um, but in my doctoral work, I started concentrating on the modern, a European, and American. And for 30 years now, I've been mainly an Americanist. Um, I'm interested in pluralism. How do people get morals, values, ethics, and have faith in a society with so many, many, many religions? And my other interest is comparing um, experiences. I led a six-year study, five volumes, of comparing fundamentalisms around the world. I've compared ethno-nationalisms in religion, human rights in religion. I like to say, what's it like in Malaysia? What's it like in Jordan? What's it like in Tokyo? What's it like in Chicago? Let's pick one of those areas and start with fundamentalism. You've written, a mm -hmm. five, you've worked on a five-volume set of that mm -hmm. for the University of Chicago. Uh, fundamentalism, for one reason or another, has uh, has many connotations to it. What does it mean to you? Fundamentalism, to me and to us, there were about ninety of us, and we worked out a kind of a definition out of our findings, <clears throat> is not the same thing as conservatism, or traditionalism, or orthodoxy. We call it the old-time religion, but it's a very new invention, really. It takes elements of that remote past. Fundamentalists are people who feel totally threatened by some features or other of what we would call modernity. Pluralism, they'd like it if only one religion were around. Or a relativism, everything is equally true and thus equally false. Uh, slackening of law in Islam. Uh, doubting the story of Moses in Judaism. Um, doctrinal wavering on creation, evolution, and so on in Christianity, and, and you react against it. You become an elect people. You have a special mission. You know exactly where God wants you to go, and then you carry it out. Most places, it gains quickly a political tie. 
In the United States, it waited 50 years before it did. It was kind of recessive. But around the world, it's almost instantly a, a movement that would try to change the human situation by changing its politics. Karen Armstrong, the British religious writer, said, it, it says in her studies that she believes that it comes from people who have been marginalized. There's no doubt about it that most fundamentalists, at least in our part of the world, are from peoples who have been pushed off to the borders. They're, they're resentful. They were called hillbilly and holy roller and redneck and uh, backwoods and all that. And um, resenting that, they kind of move against uh, elites, the media, secular humanism, religious liberals, whoever it will be. They have a very clearly defined foe that they'll move against. But what's interesting is that in most cases, you move quickly from the politics of resentment to the politics of will to power. You savor just enough victory that you think maybe you could run the show or run a big part of it. In some parts of the world, for example, the Arab Islamic world, where you never had what we call separation of church and state, you, you make a pretty immediate advance move to try to take over. In the United States, they pretty well, most of them, play by the rules of the game, try to get constitutional amendments, and try to get legislation. Uh, they're not uh, terrorists waiting to bomb the World Trade Center or anything like that. They're running the computer at your university. They're uh, running their checkout counter. They're uh, at the ballpark with you and so on. With that in mind, is there is there any particular, let me rephrase that, with that in mind, are you surprised by the rise of fundamentalism here and around the world? I don't know anybody who's studying fundamentalism today who is of my age who foresaw it in 1965. <clears throat> when we all started writing essays in the 60s on toward the year 2000, all the scenarios were that the world would be secular, uh, profane, uh, godless, practical, empirical, contractual. All the scenarios were that way. But over the last 20 years or so, around the world, there are, as we say, massive, convulsive ingatherings of peoples. And right now, that's a stronger force than any secular force uh, in the world, in most parts of the world. With someone who has dozens of books on the uh, on the shelves around the country, are you with someone who, as someone who has dozens of books out there? You've seen the uh, religious offerings in the popular bookstores very, well, just explode in the past few years. Uh, what's your thinking on that? What's going on? If you'd go to a bookstore 30 years ago in a city like Chicago, all of us authors do see whether we're there, I would go to, say, Marshall Field's book section, and there'd be a section called Religion, and there'd be the Bible, and Billy Graham, and Norman Vincent Peale, and Rabbi Liebman, and that was it. And today you go and there's religion, spirituality, occult, metaphysical, uh, alternative, holistic, holistic, new age, all over the wall. What's going on? I think, um, for one thing, a lot of other systems gave out. Communism failed, imploded. A lot of things we believed on in the West uh, haven't come true. We thought that Science would master everything. Science gives us great gifts, but it also gives us germ warfare and uh, cancers that come with pesticides. So we don't have quite the faith we thought we'd have. And as these other things crumble, people are looking. Uh, many of them do the, through the traditional institutions, and uh, that won't show so much in the bookstores. But for many, there is either a disappointment with, rejection of, distancing from the institution. And for them, uh, the bookstore, the television program, the weekend retreat, the uh, lecture by the guru of your choice takes that place. Does the human being require religion as, as one of the characteristics of being truly human? I like, I like to quote a French philosopher, Merleau-Ponty, who says, because we are present to a world, we are condemned to meaning. We didn't ask to be here. It's fired point blank at us. There's only chaos unless somebody teaches us words, teaches us gestures, and so on. So I would say meaning searches are innate in us. But for most of us, the vast majority of humans, and far more in 1998, 99 than people thought 50 years ago, um, we do that through the myths, stories, symbols, rites, ceremonies that come with uh, religion. Uh, there are always debates, uh, is the human homo religiosus, that is innately religious. 
I don't know how you quite prove that. I would just say that uh, while significant numbers of people seem to lead full lives without having worked this out, uh, the vast majority, uh, I'm going to say, a uh, vast majority outside of Western Europe, <laughs> which is the area where it seems to be least vivid, um, are somehow religious, yes. Western Europe, of course, having undergone a cataclysmic war in the middle of this century, uh, some historians and some religious historians say that that's probably one of the reasons that it isn't as popular there. Why is it so popular? Why is religion so much a part of American life? And you've just completed, I believe, a, a three-volume set mm -hmm. of religion in yes. America yourself. What happened in Western Europe is, is a real interesting puzzle. For one thing, religion stayed established too long. If you're in Spain, you're a Catholic. If you're in Sweden, you're Lutheran. If you're in England, you're Anglican. And they coasted. They didn't work at it and uh, took it for granted. In America, uh, the competitive principle is there, and you're all swimming or drowning. And I think that's one of the things that have been a great inventiveness. I think the mix of peoples, every new infusion of immigrants, bring along little bits of the religion they'd known, and then they see new opportunity here. And if there's nothing here, something new gets invented for them. Um, I think it's a land of tremendous opportunity, and people look at the opportunities and say, well, uh, God must be making it for us. We've not had a World War I where a million men die in two weeks and the trenches don't move 200 yards. We've never had that, that abyss of meaninglessness they had. Um, so both to meet our anxieties and to relish our opportunities, I think we've tended to reach for this rich cafeteria line offering of religions. What possibilities does that hold for the future of religion and religious faith in America? I think that we're probably currently overselling this individualized spirituality. That is, you have to come up with something new every year. Uh, this year it's seances and talking to someone on the other side. I've talked to a publisher who has a new manuscript on angels and say, oh, angels, that's four years ago. Um, channeling, oh, that was eight years ago. There's a quick grinding up, and I think that a lot of people will lose heart uh, from that for a while. And some of them will go, I like to say, to moorings. They'll have moorings again in mainly Judaism and Christianity and Islam, but also Buddhism and Hinduism. I don't think it's going to be easy for religious institutions, because just not because we say God has died, but because we arrange our weeks differently. Um, the weekend is disintegrating and blending into the week. Uh, High-rise apartments, you don't do the same kind of attention to local uh, institutions that you do in single-family houses. So it's always going to be hard for the institutions, but they're not going to disappear. What holds the greatest promise for them? I think the greatest promise uh, for religion in the end is if and when it probes for what are the deepest, deepest needs in the human heart and the richest stories that address them. Uh, you can go for 10 years, 20 years on uh, novelty, innovation, or whatever. But I always think it's what, what makes sense to you at 3 in the morning. You wake up and you feel the lump and you think, maybe I have cancer and life is short and I'm pretty little. And does it add up to anything? Uh, what gives you the joy when a baby's born? Uh, what gives you the comfort when someone dies? Uh, I think attention to that, uh, whoever stays with that, uh, will be the winner, if you will, in the battle for uh, survival and prosperity. What are the things that inspire you at that lonely hour in the early morning? What, uh, how has your faith evolved over the years? I have to say that um, if I have weak faith, doubting faith, everybody has some of that, uh, I wouldn't read a book of theology. I think I would go into an empty cathedral on a Saturday afternoon and listen to the organist practice. Maybe it just connotes those things I heard at my father's organ bench as a child. Uh, maybe it's because music itself has that transcendent push. It, it's always pushing you out to the boundary. A lot of otherwise non-religious people will be at music of the Baroque hearing the great music of that age, not because they believe in the God to which it points, but because it takes them beyond the normal horizon. And then the third, I think, um, I would go to friends. I think that people who've weathered things with you um, who have uh, helped you get down off your high horse or put you to work or comforted you uh, have a way of, um, well, uh, John Cardinal Newman liked to quote, Lor, uh, cor ad cor loquitur, heart speaketh unto heart. And I think that's where faith gets re-nurtured by the 
testimony, if you will, of someone who's going through doubts too. You wrote movingly about uh, such issues with the passing of your first wife, and many people talk to you about that today. You've, you've said that you like to write books that touch people. Could you elaborate? Well, I, uh, I don't know whether I'm schizoid or whether I just operate with different modes of existence, because a lot of people think you have to make a choice between uh, scholarly scholarship and being a professor's professor or historian's historian, or a popularizer um, and uh, um, a, an autobiographical writer or whatever. And I don't think that's true at all. I think many of the greatest of the historians uh, let you know a little bit of where they come from. I think they have to remain fair-minded, but they have to know where they come from. So I like to put a little passion into the history, um, and yet it can't bear all the things that you'd like to say. And so I do like to put myself in a situation of people that, uh, that have to think through the tough stuff uh, these years, my son and I are doing a series together that I really enjoy uh, working with. He's a photographer, and every year I do 47 meditations that are designed, like his pictures, to speak to the heart. And uh, I hope to do many more now that I'm retiring from the others, but I won't let the scholarship go. With over something like 50 books in print, how do you find the time to do this? When, when do you write, and what, what conditions are best for you to write? I hear you write in the back of cars, and <laughs> dictate as you're going all over the country. To write books, I do have to be alone in spans. I can't do an hour a day. Kafka once says that for the writer, the night is never night enough and the silence is never silent enough. Now, there were years when there were, one year we had seven boys aged 9 to 14 running around the house, so you don't get a lot of silence except before they're up or after they're in bed. And you look for those things. Summer is my book writing time. Uh, I need four, six, eight hour stretches to do books. But I can write columns, editorials, and so on uh, in little bits and snatches. And I write some every day. But books are really um, hard to write. <laughs> and they take a lot of loneliness. For 11 years, we lived on an island where there were only five houses, no electricity, pre-computer age. And uh, I wrote an awful lot of uh, things up there where there was no telephone, uh, no electricity, no running water, and no visitors unless they stumbled onto our island. That was paradise. Where do you get your ideas? People have trouble believing this, but I have never yet written a book that somebody didn't ask for. I've just decided so far to let my life be guided by that. Uh, I know a lot of publishers, a lot of editors, and they'll say, Marty, uh, well, the book about after my wife's death. Uh, Marty, you've been sitting around this winter thinking about it. Why don't you track it down? Somebody who spent some time at our campfire said, you folks do a lot with friendship. Why don't you, uh, you wrote a column about friendship, write a book about friendship. Somebody else said, nobody's yet put together the story of 20th century American religion. Why don't you write four volumes on it? Uh, they're all coming that way. And then I just plunge into a library and uh, read, 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 read. Uh, one book I did, Pilgrims in Their Own Land, I think I did nine drafts. Uh, first draft was four times as long as the others. I lugged some 500 books up to that island, and I just plunge in. That's, so I guess uh, I get my ideas by encountering uh, minds who've already been somewhere. I read in, in, in one article that you, you like to use sort of a religion detector to, to look for look for themes, look for ideas mm -hmm. in popular culture. Is that a fair, fair way of putting it? I put a lot of energy into um, doing what at the Public Religion Project calls, I have a little column that we put out on the uh, internet, called sightings. Uh, just as you have sightings of land in the distance, uh, we have sightings right under the surface of many things that we don't consider religious are profoundly religious questions. So I'm less interested, I think, in someone who comes along and says, here's my banner, I'm saved, are you saved, uh, I'm religious, are you religious? I'd much rather take a poet who uh, uh, is, is wrestling well. Uh, Donald Hall and Jane Kenyon, the, uh, the couple, both of whom had cancer, and uh, both are wrestling with it in their poetry. Um, that's the kind of thing that inspires me then to uh, ideas of my own, I guess you'd say. Your, uh, your work has also taken on uh, uh, the founding of institutes, the Park Ridge Institute, the, uh, public, the public religion project, we're, we're in the offices now. Let's talk about those, uh, those aspects of your career. What, uh, what are you trying to achieve? 
As with everything else, I like to live my vocation, my calling. Somebody has to call and I respond. Somebody said, well, you make a feasibility study about a place that would do a three-year feasibility study. Somebody said, would you do a three-year feasibility study about a place that would connect faith with health and ethics? And I said, I don't believe in feasibility studies. I'll start one and you can kill it. And that became the Park Ridge Center. Uh, I came back from Salzburg and my uh, deans told me, uh, you have just founded the Institute for the Advanced Study of Religion at the University of Chicago. Uh, well, I hadn't, but then I did. And the Public Religion Project, the Pew Charitable Trust, came and asked whether I would put my energies into this. Um, the Fundamentalism Project, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences asked. I think what authors do is you acquire a reputation for a certain approach to learning and organization, and then they come to you, and that's how I've done it. Uh, what difference I like to make? I'd like to think, uh, I do think, that the Park Ridge Center, uh, more than any other institution, has helped people bring together the serious questions of uh, medical ethics with their faith. Um, I do believe that the Public Religion Project is doing a great deal to help, uh, as its charter is, to uh, bring to light and interpret the forces of faith in American society. Um, nobody, I'm not messianic or whatever, nobody's going to turn everything around. I just think we all are given gifts to make little incremental differences in the world, and I think these do. I'd like to ask a little bit more about the Park Ridge Center because today, science, medical science mm -hmm. in particular, with uh, the uh, decoding of DNA, mm -hmm. with the, uh, the possibilities of cloning, are those kinds of things going to drive these issues even closer together? Make them more critical yeah. of the study? Right. The um, Templeton Foundation has uh, put a lot of energy and funding into the meeting place of science and theology. And it does this by cosmology, the grand big questions, astrophysics and God, um, evolution, uh, the whole microbiological evolutionary process, uh, n neurology, uh, the brain, and then health in general. I think those four are the hot ones. Uh, I'm most interested in the, the brain and, uh, and the health situation. Um, I don't know why evolution never really gave me a big challenge. I don't, I'm not smart enough to know what's at issue. But brain does. That is, uh, is God an invention of neuron firings in our brain? Uh, are we nothing but chemical processes and so on? That's a lot scarier, I think, than uh, is, is God one-eighth of an inch bigger than the known universe or something that, that we can't think about those things. Um, yes, uh, the technological changes, I think, are what produced this uh, impulse to ask questions in a different way, and that's going to keep going. I think it's even more tantalizing the further you break it down. I think religion made a big mistake after 1859 when it uh, bought the terms of Andrew Dixon White that um, there's a warfare of science and theology. Uh, there was a distancing of science and theology. They, they, they walked into separate worlds and didn't understand each other. They'll never talk the same language. I wouldn't want them to. Um, I wouldn't want them to. They should talk their own languages, but then they have to meet and they converse. And it's on that front that we've seen so much interest. When the Park Ridge Center was formed, I don't think we had the faintest idea. I was just telling someone the other day, uh, Lenin once was asked what happened. He said, I saw power lying in the streets and I merely picked it up. And I think a place like the Park Ridge Center saw meaning lying in the streets and picked it up. Uh, we had no idea of the demands on religion and aging, religion and sexuality, religion and civility, religion in adolescence, religion in suffering. Um, we don't always use the word religion. It might be faith. It might be spirituality. But those categories are operative. Let's discuss uh, the, uh, the Public Religion Project. What are its goals and what do you, what do you hope to accomplish with it? Okay. The Public Religion Project was really born because people who were dealing with questions like homosexuality, abortion, um, physician-assisted suicide, found that you can get pretty far in the discussion until religious people come on the scene. And then on both sides, they get so extreme that it stops. And so we were asked to address that. But very quickly, we changed the charter. We keep doing that a little bit. But um, we were then asked to say, can you be sure that uh, you have representative voices at the table, not just the same sets of people, thus the uh, Muslims of America? Let's turn now to the work of the Public Religion mm -hmm. Project. What goals did you have for it when, when you began it? 
The Pew Charitable Trust of Philadelphia made a three-year grant to the University of Chicago and asked me to head uh, this project. Um, its mission is clearly stated to bring to light and interpret the forces of faith in a pluralistic society by doing four things. One, get more kinds of voices to the table. If the Muslims aren't being heard, get them to the table. If the religious right isn't being heard, they tend to be heard, but not in company of others. Uh, bring them uh, to the table. Um, secondly, um, as the head of the foundation said to me, uh, the word is out that because you will deal with the Center for Healing and you've done this study of killing the name of religion, Marty cares about religion when it kills people or heals people, uh, lift out the healing side. The mass media don't know how to handle religion until somebody gets bombed. Get, get close to the heart. How do the people get reconciled? How is their shalom? How is their healing? Third, when it is destructive, engage it. We haven't done a lot of that because you can't invite people to the table after you've said you're destructive <laughs> and so on. But we do uh, a little bit of that. And fourth, tell stories of places where people do um, put their faith to work and overcome uh, distances or take on hard issues. Uh, those are the four main areas. Out of it, we will produce three books, one on uh, religion and politics and government, one on business and commerce, and one on education on all levels. And then I always compare us to an atomic accelerator. Um, the stuff is all around. We just take it and spin it around and push it on further. Uh, we hope it'll be picked up a lot of other places uh, after the project, and I will be uh, pooped. Will there be an ongoing uh, focus for bringing people together, like the symposia, uh, different meetings? During our three years, we will have had nine consultations on our three main subjects. We will have had any number of um, site visits. Minnesota Public Radio, we spent a day with 10 different tables of 10 business people, uh, politicians, arts people, or whatever. Um, we work with scholarly societies as they plan their programs to get religion into it. Uh, we have a database by which we help people in mass media learn uh, to whom to talk. When it's over, it will spin off into numbers of things. One of them is, I'm delighted to say, uh, a new center started at the University of Chicago named after me, the Martin Marty Center for Public Religion. And, uh, uh, we okay. We've got a really bad interference. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Let's just close mm -hmm. camera. And Jack will be looking at Mark. Okay. And, uh, anytime. There will be a center named after you at the University of Chicago. And, and what will its purpose be? They surprised me. Everyone I know knew, but I didn't, that they were starting this center. And on my 70th birthday, I learned about it. And it will be designed to keep these accents on the public face of religion vivid. But a special twist will be to help prepare scholars of tomorrow and existing faculties to uh, bring their scholarship out into the public forum. The head of one of the large religious scholarly societies said uh, to me one day, you folks open more doors for us than we have people to walk through. In all the academic disciplines, we get very good at our specialty, but we, we forget what the public needs by way of translation, which for me is never talking down, it's talking over. It's harder, it's easy to write. I can write history where my footnotes have footnotes, and it's no strain at all, but to have to explain it. And uh, this center will help people uh, in their decisive stages, uh, learn to keep that in mind in their scholarship. Will this be the next chapter for your life's work? I will not be directly involved with the center. I don't believe in being. They're very generous uh, in all these ways. I, I'll be on an advisory board, but I will not be in on picking the uh, leadership or the basic policies. Uh, I believe in looking forward. I'm an historian who professionally looks backward, but I think it's terrible to ask a 70-year-old to envision what's going to be needed 20 years from now. I'd rather have... Uh, new people on the scene and do that projecting. You're a very energetic 70-year-old. What, <laughs> what, what do you anticipate doing next in your own work? After the project here has uh, folded into the other causes, um, I will still do my Tuesdays and maybe a little more at the Park Ridge Center. I do intend to keep that uh, faith and health theme going. And I owe volume four of my four-volume work. And I'm writing a book called to. Uh, uh, the Killer That Heals, about uh, religion. What is it about it that it can both uh, kill and heal? Um, I would want to do more books with my son, and I want to write a book someday. The publisher hasn't asked me yet, and so I have to wait. 
uh, on the presence to match a book I once wrote called A Cry of Absence. So that ought to take 15, 20 years. <laughs> what will the presence be about? I'm interested in the ways in which um, serious people, people have their feet on the ground, people are true realists, have some sense that there's more to the story than just the atoms and the molecules and the neuron firings. Um, I don't mean that in any ghostly sense, that you have somebody hovering in your room, but, but, but the more. Uh, it comes again when I hear the organ play, uh, when I see a new birth, when I see the right uh, uh, drop of dew on a, on, a, on a leaf in an early morning, when I see a, a smile on the face of a cancer patient. Uh, something is going on there that I don't think you can just reduce and say this is nothing but a twitch of a muscle. You've led me to a question. I wasn't sure if I was going to ask, but you, you've certainly opened the door for it. If you had an opportunity to ask your creator a question, what would you ask? I'd ask the creator why neuron firings in the brain can be off a little bit and wonderful people are schizophrenic and wonderful people are autistic, and wonderful people are uh, obsessive-compulsive, and wonderful people mess up little boys, and all those things. That is, I don't give everything to genetics, and I don't give everything to the brain uh, forces, but I believe they're just inexplicably uh, complex things that good people do that turns them bad, and, um, and I have no accounting for that. That would be my way of getting into the standard roughest question, which is called theodicy, what is the presence of evil in the world. But I guess I'm so interested in uh, not just uh, what we do to interpret accident and chance and luck, bad and good, but um, how do we relate to the handicaps that we're born with, uh, what happens when you can't transcend them and not all can transcend them, so I guess the Creator and I would have a little chat about that, and I have one scheduled someday. What answers do you have so far? I think I could only say, I guess with Doug Hammarskjöld, that in the midst of all of the no, no, no's, there come signals that uh, lead you to affirm, and you, you dare your yes. And there are so many consequences to the yes. Uh, responsibility goes from it. Compassion goes from it. Uh, storytelling grows from it. All these things grow from, uh, from it. And uh, I think those are human capacities that suggest to me that's their part of the larger answer. It may come down finally to uh, the story of what human hope means. Professor Marty, good luck in your search. Thanks Thank you. so much. I am going to ask one more question. Yeah. Here. I just I like the publishers. I like to have you guide it. <laughs> yeah, good questions. I like that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, this is fun. This is uh, this is mm -hmm. one of the favorite parts of my job. Yeah. I, I did want to ask you. Um, you still rolling? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I did want to ask you about uh, your your nomination to the Lincoln Academy and how that uh, how how you received that word and how how mm -hmm. it felt for you. I love the local. I often have quoted George Santayana, who says, you need a locus standi to view the world. And my two places to stand are my boyhood place, Nebraska, I collect novels, and uh, my state, Illinois. And I gave a governor's lecture in which I made quite a point of it that uh, Chicagoans often don't notice the rest of the state, and the land of Lincoln doesn't notice the southern and the northern, and the southern doesn't know the rest of us. So I made a heavy commitment to feeling a part of Illinois, which I began to learn 30-some years ago when the was on the first board of the Illinois Humanities Council. So I've always had that uh, interest. I've gotten to know the people at Southern, Eastern, Western, and Northern, and the little colleges like uh, Illinois and so on, more than most Chicagoans do. So when the state of Illinois, uh, through any of its agencies, uh, private and or public, says, uh, y'all come, I come running, and so it was quite a thrill. Thanks very much.